As is our manner, we will continue in our study of Ecclesiastes, beginning by reading the whole chapter. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God, who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. And walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. So here in continuation of our study, we're at Ecclesiastes chapter 11, finally. And uh, I've really been enjoying this study. We have one more chapter left after this. Uh, this one here is a short one, but I think it uh, nicely ties in the, uh, the general theme of everything that the uh, preacher's been talking about. He began, again, saying, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And as we learned and grew as we went through this portion of Scripture, we started to see that He's basically encouraging us that while we walk and live in this vain world and in this vain life, we are to rejoice in the increase that God has given us by hard work and by wisdom that we would grow in. So, this passage is no different, as I said. In verse 1 he says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. You can keep your finger there in Ecclesiastes, if you were, to go back to Leviticus, right before Numbers, Leviticus, and I can just read it for you, if you will. Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30, the Bible reads, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. So here he is saying very clearly, all the tithe is the Lord's. And when we read in scriptures about the tithe and about that particular giving back unto God, it was a tenth of all. And this is something, again, that predates the law, and it also is still in effect today. But here in the context of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, he says, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Here, thy bread, I believe, is a portion of that same substance that you have received. Verse 2 says, Give a portion to seven, and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. What I'm going to talk about today is giving in a vain world. Giving in a vain world. The reason why I talked about the tithe is because specifically that tenth of your increase is the Lord's. God makes it very clear the tithe is the Lord's. And if you are to withhold that tenth of your increase, you're actually robbing God. He says that in Malachi, right at the beginning of the, or right at the end of the Old Testament. He reads in Malachi, he says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings is a response from God. So here he says, Cast thy bread. So what God is talking about here is not his portion, it's not his bread, but rather the portion that has been given as possession to the person in discussion right now. So their portion, their bread, their substance, their possession, their increase 
It's given to them and each one of us, the 90% of whatever our income is, to be stewards over. And a steward is simply this, is somebody that has a responsibility of supervising or taking care of a thing. Whether you are a steward of a land or whether you are a steward of the financial increase that you've gotten, uh, that's to be discussed in, uh, in, in variation, in the very various different ways that increase happens. But the stewardship that we have, thy bread, is what we are overseeing here. And it's our responsibility to supervise, take care of that portion of our increase to the best of our ability. The charge then here is to take of that bread and cast it upon many waters. Now that seems strange. Are we supposed to just throw it away or are we supposed to just rid ourselves with of it? No, I think that these two verses, verse 1 and verse 2, go together. You see, cast thy bread and you say, give a portion. In other words, the same thing is being stuck, discussed here. We are giving a portion. We are casting thy bread. Or if you will, we are giving thy bread or we are casting a portion. Those two, I believe, can be interchangeable. And what the charge is of it, going upon many waters or going to seven and also to eight in the context of giving in the New Testament church, he is saying to indiscriminately, in other words, with, with not much overcare, with not much worry, with not much concern, you are supposed to cast thy bread upon many waters. You're not thinking of it much or long when you simply put it out there, the gift that you are giving. And the next portion that you see, the next idea that you see about giving thy bread or casting thy portion, first do it indiscriminately, second do it without measure. Above measure even, generosity is what's being charged here when he says, give a portion to seven and also to eight. So cast your bread upon waters. Give a portion to seven and also to eight is what's being charged here in the area of giving in this vain world that we live in. And why should we do this? Well, look at the second portion of, of uh, chapter or verse two, where it says, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. In other words, it's a vain world. Uh, it, this life is fleeting. This earth even is, is fleeting. Things change all the time. Political uh, atmospheres shift, shift and sway and all sorts of things can come. You don't know what evil tomorrow may bring. And so give. Be a giving person. Be somebody that is not holding on to everything that they possess. Every piece of bread that they have. Every portion that they receive due to their work and their labors or due to gifts that come upon them. They'll be willing to give it. You can turn to Luke chapter 16, keep your finger there in Ecclesiastes 11. And Luke chapter 16 is the parable then of the unjust steward. Luke chapter 16. And there you're going to find a story that has often puzzled me because what you'll find in the parable here of the unjust steward is, is a worldly man acting very worldly and being commended for it. Look what it says in verse 1 of Luke chapter 16. And he said unto his disciples, there was a certain rich man which had a steward. Right? The steward again, that is somebody that is supervising or taking care of something. And this steward, it says of him, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, how is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then said he unto another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. And the Lord commanded the unjust steward, because he had done wisely in this statement, for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So here the story, it seems to end strangely to me. Like I said, he is commended for what he does. Essentially, he takes what is owed unto his boss, and he is to be the steward over all that the boss, the boss has in goods, all that the Lord has in his goods. 
And he goes to those that have borrowed of the goods. And if you owed 100, well, now you owe 50. And if you owed 100, well, now you owe 80. And he's just chopping off all of the debts that belong unto his Lord. And so I say to myself, I mean, this is an unrighteous thing. And this is why the parable is often called the unjust steward. But the Lord here commends him because he had done wisely. And what was his purpose for doing it? He said that they may receive me into their houses. So he used the leverage that he had with these people to take of what belonged unto his Lord, but to benefit because of it. It is a very, it is a very no good and rotten thing to do. Yet the Lord here commends him. He was ripping him off, and this is why he was set to lose his job. And to regain his own interests, he then rips him off further. And how strange is it that the Lord would commend him for this? Although I did note that it didn't say he kept his job because of it. He, he was still let go. He was still likely, likely fired and put out of the stewardship. Perhaps the Lord just had enough that he didn't need to worry about the percentages that he was losing. But he commended him in this anyways. Here is the spiritual application, and this is what Jesus is going to start talking about. He says, And I say unto you, this is verse 9 of Luke chapter 16, And I say unto you, Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive into you everlast they may receive you into everlasting habitations. So God here commands us or, or gives us the charge that we should make to ourselves friends of the mammon or money of unrighteousness, that we too, just as this steward saw it, could be received into everlasting habitations should we fall. Now God here is not commanding us that we go and rip off our bosses in order to benefit ourselves and the world around us. But what I think he's saying is, be somebody that is giving. Be somebody that takes of perhaps a gift that was received to you or perhaps the extra of your increase and be somebody that is just generally giving in and among the world that you would have friends of the mammon of righteousness, friends that have lots of money perhaps, so that when you fall they may receive you into everlasting habitations. In verse 10 it says this, He that is faithful, now which is least, is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is also is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? So the spiritual application here, and what he's trying to teach from this parable is, hey, make of yourselves friends in the area of that which is least. Be faithful in that which is the least. And here, what is the least in the context of the world is money. Christ didn't put a great emphasis on money in the church world, in the, in the personal world, and in any type of realm that he lived in. And how do we know this? Well, because he gave Judas the bag. Right? He had no problem giving the one who was a liar from the beginning, a thief from the beginning, no problem whatsoever giving him stewardship over the finances. And so, as a picture, Christ says, hey, if you can't be responsible for or a good steward over that which is least, who is going to trust unto you true riches? It seems like finances here and giving of them and, and, and using them in a particular way are something that has great spiritual ramifications. Because what would the true riches be? The true riches would be what we obtain in heaven, what we absorb in heaven because we have laid up for ourselves treasure upon heaven, not upon earth. So one way I believe that we can have a good and proper stewardship over the bread that we have as our portion is by giving it. Just being a vessel that simply receives of it and gives it. And when we do that, we make friends in the realm of the mammon of, of, of unrighteousness. In other words, if we're somebody that when we has, we give, Due to the laws of sowing and reaping, when you have not, you will receive. Just because God simply commands that universe around you to move in that direction. This is what God is commanding for us. That we be people that don't clasp on or grab a hold of all our possessions. But rather we would be people that are very fluid with it. In other words, we receive, we give, we receive, we give. It's just, it's, it's just nothing that we think long 
or regularly upon. We don't have much care in those areas. Now why he says, cast your bread upon waters, for they shall return unto you. While we're in the New Testament, go over to Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, which talks a little bit more about, about giving. <clears throat> so here we looked at the parable of the unjust steward and how he used of his finances, um, his, someone else's finances, in other words, to, to gain and to grow, as a picture of how we're to uh, be sort of fluid with our finances, not grabbing hold of everything, using them to be faithful, but also just to basically be somebody who would be liked of those around them because they're not grabbing hold. They're not money hungry. They're not greedy. Matthew chapter 6, this speaks more about giving of alms. And alms are simply money that is given, food that is given uh, generally to somebody less fortunate than you. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. So here, don't do your alms before men. Like sometimes that can happen. But here the, the motive is driven home to be seen of them. So sometimes you will give and you will be, for, be before men, but your heart has to be in such a case that you're not doing it just for, to be seen of them. And if you're doing, if you're giving to be seen, you have your reward. You have no reward of the Father, but your reward is here. Yes, you'll get applause, you'll get glory here among men, but that's not our ultimate goal when we're giving. It would be great that when we give, it's out of a heart that simply just wants to help, and God will bless us because of that. We would have reward of him. Verse 2, Therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward openly. Another great example of God's ability to see all, right? His omnipresence here. Because he seeth what we do in secret. He seeth the case of our heart when we give. And the Bible here says, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. And uh, it's simply a, a way of, of a, a play on words or, or a way of describing what it says next, that thy alms may be in secret. So if you're not letting your left hand know what your right hand doeth, you're not putting much care. You're not caring for, you're not monitoring. You're, you're essentially keeping secret from the one hand what you're doing with the other. Your giving is something that is a little bit more natural and not so calculated. Just like it says, cast upon many waters your bread, in other words, just, just let it go. Just, just set it out into the waters. And it's done in secret. Be rewarded openly is what the Bible is telling when you have that attitude. And if you were to look into the next portion of Scripture that we looked at in Luke, it talks about how if you were to have that attitude with your finances and be a giving person, receiving unto yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, you could be received into habitations. You could be rewarded, yes, openly. And as the Bible says back in Ecclesiastes chapter 11, we'll go there, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, as, as it describes receiving into everlasting habitations or receiving that open gift of the Father because you have been giving to those that had the means of supplying for you when you fall, just like it says here, cast your bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. We don't always know the timing for when these things come to pass, but you're going to be thankful that you were a giving person when you find that same bread after many days returned unto you. Again, what's being described here in Ecclesiastes, maybe in a little bit of a, a, a different type of language, maybe not so clear, he's describing that law of reaping what you sow. He's saying that if you cast your bread, you shall find it after many days. And this is just another one of those natural laws that God has ordained in this world, that you reap whatsoever man soweth, that also shall he reap. And many days simply indicates perhaps that you, you just don't know when. You don't know when you are going to reap what you have sown. And some of us even today can think of situations in our life where perhaps we have sown something and reaped of the same soon after. And when we look back, we're like, man, some of this might be attributed to how I was behaving one year ago, two years ago, three years ago. If I was rebellious against my boss, say, like two years ago, and then I'm wondering why everybody who I'm overseeing now is being rebellious, 
rebellious towards me, I can think back and go, you know what? I sowed that into my life. I definitely was a rotten employee. And now that I'm the boss, I'm definitely just reaping what I've sown. And you have to wait a while for whatever you are sowing to kind of play out. If you're reaping, or if you're sowing good into your life and you reap of the same, we don't want that to ever end. But sometimes we sow bad things into our lives, we reap of the same. And it's this patient waiting for that time to pass by. But again, this is, a, this is the same thing. We're to give a portion. What we're talking about here is giving in this vain world. Verse 3 says, and here's another just natural law statement that comes out. He just said, you know, describe the idea of casting bread and receiving it. Sowing and reaping. In verse 3 it says, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Aren't these just profound statements? Yeah. When the clouds are full of rain, it falls. <laughs> when, when the tree falls, whether it's the north, south, east, west, wherever it falls, hey, there it lies. These statements, Solomon, the wisest man on, on earth, is making these very, these very just, just base statements understood by anybody. Of course, this is just common sense. It's full, it falls. <laughs> the tree falls, and that's where it lies. But he's doing that to show you that this is just a simple law, just something that we can simply comprehend and know that, hey, if we're to cast our bread, if we're to give a portion to seven and also to eight, if we're to disperse it upon many waters, just as those clouds get full and the rain falls, and just as that tree falls and hits the ground, where it lies, it lies. It's the same as receiving it after many days, what you have sown, what you have given, what you have cast out. Here, he's showing that the generous abundant sowing we will come back to you in generous abundant reaping verse 4 it says he that observeth the wind shall not sow and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap so what happens here is that the people that are often observing the wind that is before them they're often checking out the atmosphere they're making sure that it's the perfect day to sow it's the perfect field to sow into it's the perfect in the, in the context of what we're dealing with, the waves are just right for us to cast the bread so that it won't be many days, it'll come right back to me. Those are the ones that inevitably just do no sowing. They're observing the wind, and therefore they shall not sow. In other words, they've found a perfect window where this is going to be their opportunity to sow. And wouldn't you know it, God just has the weather a little bit north of this and a little bit south of that. And so they never find the window where they're actually going to do any kind of sowing, any kind of casting, any kind of what? Giving is what we're talking about. They're waiting for the perfect day, for the perfect paycheck, for the perfect opportunity, for the perfect person, the recipient that they're going to give to. And the reality is, is that if we live that way, if we're very careful about how we give, about how we distribute, we just won't give at all. He that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. In the same way, if we're just always looking for the right opportunity, the work will never get done. The will of God will never get done, especially in this area of giving. We always say, if I won a million dollars, man, I would just buy the church a building. You know, we always have these crazy things we think. That's somebody that is observing the wind. And the reality is they won't sow. Even if they got that a million dollars, they wouldn't sow because they never had the heart to give like it's being discussed here. They never had that true um, resolve to just relinquish or release whatever they had. So sowing here, we find in the context, is the most important aspect of reaping. Again, this is a natural law that God always brings to us. And I think, again, a little bit of veiled um, language uh, in Ecclesiastes, aside from the very clear verse 3, he's giving us that idea that, hey, you need to sow thy seed and withhold it not if you want to reap bountifully. Look at verse 5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God, who maketh all. In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall be a like good. When you're sowing in the morning and when you're sowing in the evening, what are you doing? You're just sowing all 
the time. You don't know what the outcome is going to be in any area of these things, just as you do not know how the bones of a child are formed within the womb of a mother. You don't understand these things. So why do we seek to understand, calculate, determine the perfect time of all things so that we can make the correct action in the realm of God's will. No, we just need to do what God's will is all the time and trust Him to close the gaps. Trust Him to take our leaps of faith and do what He seems is appropriate. Do what He deems good and right. Like it says, whether they shall both alike be good, whether they both shall be alike good. What you cast in the morning, what you cast in the evening, you don't know what the end result is, so just cast thy seed. And we can take this application and apply it directly to soul winning, right? We don't need to be in the most receptive area all the time. What we need to understand is that if we sow bountifully, we shall reap. So we can go in to the most offended neighborhood, the most resistant neighborhood to the gospel, and we can sow and sow and sow and sow, and we shall reap abundantly. This is what the Bible promises. Yeah, it might take some while to get get. Uh, ground and get rooted up. It may take some time. That many days may be many days beyond. Even our understanding, and we may be waiting and waiting and waiting. But the law of sowing and reaping applies, and it's not something that we can just ignore. We can go in so bountifully and expect by faith to reap of the same. But again, we're not talking about soul winning specifically here. But what we are talking about is casting thy bread, or like I think from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1 and verse 2. It's talking about the same thing. Cast thy bread, give a portion. And when we do so, we're to do so indiscriminately. In other words, like there's no care or calculation in the world to it. Simply opportunity to give. God says give, we give. And we're to do it in abundance. Give a portion to seven. Hey, why not eight? You know, go above measure, go above and beyond, because giving is simply an area of our lives, though it takes faith to do so, that God will never withhold recompensing it in return unto us. God says, so abundantly you shall reap of the same. Uh, turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we can see a specific church that, and how they dealt with the area of giving and that's the Macedonian church. So again, it's important always to have the right heart. You're going to 2 Corinthians 8. Because if we're calculated in our giving, we're just like those that are always observing the wind. We're just like those that are always trying to find the perfect weather to sow or to reap. The perfect opportunity to do one of those. And the end result is if you're always looking for the right opportunity to give, you're just not a giving person. If you're always looking for the double paycheck, okay, now I'm just set, I'm ahead on all my bills, then you're not going to be a giving person even when you do have that. Look at uh, the church in Macedonia and their pattern for giving. If you look in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of of their liberality. In other words, they were a group that had liberality in the area of giving. They were one that was just ready to cast thy bread. And the interesting thing about them is they definitely weren't a group that was looking for the right opportunity because it says, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy was received in this state of what? Deep poverty. And in the state of deep poverty, in direction towards the apostle here, they were able to give unto him. Liberality, with liberality. Look at verse 3. It says, For to their power, and I like this, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So this is a great statement and a great compliment to the Macedonian church. People will take this and they'll do something called grace giving. This is, this is the famous uh, verse that uh, independent Baptists will use. And they'll take this and they'll say, see, the Macedonian church gave beyond their power. In other words, they only make, you know, $600 a month, but they're going to they're gonna dedicate themselves to give $800 a month. And they encourage their parishioners to just 
stretch themselves and give beyond their power. I, I don't think this is talking about giving something that you don't have, though I have seen and heard testimonies of people that are like, you know what, Lord, I want to give $1,000, and they don't even make $500 that week. And God has orchestrated things such that they receive the money and they were able to give it. That's what you would call this, this idea of grace giving, giving beyond your power. But what I think it's referring to is the fact that this group is just in the abundance of poverty. So he says, yet yeah, to their power they gave this, yea, even beyond their power. They were in such poverty to even give the widow's might was a wonderful beyond their power kind of things. And I like because the reason why you catch this, the reason why they were able to do this, is because as it says at the end of verse 3, it says, they were willing of themselves. So of them, their own selves, they were willing. The Bible says in other places, it says, if there first be a willing mind is accepted. So they were willing. They had the desire to. They had the heart to. They were motivated by that deep poverty, yes, but they wanted to abound unto the riches of their liberality in order to bless the apostle here. Verse 4 says, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. It seems like they had to go to the Apostle Paul. This is why he would say something like it was beyond their power, because they had to pray the apostles would even receive of the gift. Could you imagine receiving a gift from somebody that you know is super poor? And they're literally begging you to take of the gift. And, and the Apostle Paul, he was a hardworking man. He knew he could care for himself by his tent making, but he also knew that he had churches that were supporting him. And he also knew that above all that, he had God overseeing them. And yet in this situation, the Macedonian church, talking and speaking to the riches of their liberality, gives to their power, yea, and beyond their power. And in doing so, again, the verse 4, it says, and they take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. So this is all in the context of the 2 Corinthians. So in 1 Corinthians, we saw Paul dealing with a carnal and lazy church. Of them, he said, I robbed other churches in order to minister unto. And when he was in Corinth, he labored among them. He could have received of them gifts and offerings and finances in order to support his ministry. But he walked into a carnal, lazy church and he said, you guys don't do any work. You're, you are lazy. And so he withheld receiving from them. He says robbed other churches. In other words, he took offerings from other churches in order to supply what he did there in Corinth in order to prove a point that if a man shall not work, neither shall he eat. He was trying to show them hard work by an example. And while he labored among them, he desired to teach them of the same. And here Macedonia proves this example unto them and reveals something unto the hearts of the Corinthians that they are now, I believe, ready to hear. In so much, it says in verse 6, that we desire Titus that as he had begun, so he would finish in you the same grace also. So, so much the more were they ready to receive of the understanding, having seen the example of first the apostle and second of the Macedonian church that gave well beyond their means. He decided to leave Titus there to teach them and to help them grow in that same that same area. And how did they grow? Well, it says in verse 5, look at this, it says, And this they did, this is talking about the Macedonian church again, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So the church first gave of themselves. So if they didn't have money to give, they gave of themselves, their own labor. Well, the Bible describes us as that willing sacrifice. We are presenting unto God ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's holy and acceptable unto him. And that is your reasonable service. So the Macedonian church didn't do anything special, but they simply did what they were expected to. They gave of them own selves, and that was just reasonable. But here they're being commended for doing what is reasonable. Giving of themselves then becomes that sincere expression of, of the love or the charity that they have. Verse 7 says, Therefore, as he abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, 
see that ye abound in this grace also. So at this point, we've rolled over into 2 Corinthians. Some time has passed since he rebuked them, had them throw out the fornicators, had them clean house, and just get that church in order. Now he says, you've abounded in everything. You've abounded in faith, in utterance, in knowledge, and in diligence. You've abounded even in your love toward us. But he says, see that ye abound in this grace also. In other words, there's something still lacking, something you can work in. And what is it? It says in verse 8, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And there was that ultimate sacrifice of Christ then brought into the picture as the greatest example of what? Showing the sincerity of your love by giving. The greatest gift that men can give is to give of their own lives for someone else. Next best to that would just be us giving our time because I think that's something that these days we hold most precious. A lot of us have you know, stable jobs or whatsoever. Maybe we don't think about finances so much because we always get that next paycheck. But our time is very precious unto us. Our time is something that we limit and we cherish. And, oh, I need to, I need to do this after work and this before work. And we have certain times allotted for things. But if we were to take the example of Christ, we would take of the time that we have and give it as a sacrificial offering in order that somebody else would grow in the same. And this is the great example of Christ. But again, we can keep this close to home and talk about the financial gift, which is what the apostle is talking about, that though they were poor, yet they gave and they were able to bless abundantly. It says, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, and your, for your sakes he became poor. And this was the same thing that Christ did, was that he stepped down from the throne, became poor, in order that we might be rich and inherit all things by him. So I believe that, yes, the best way to express the sincerity of our love is by ministering here, it talks about, to the saints. So a good way to contradict that idea of, like, grace giving, where you need to say to the church that, you know, maybe if you only make $500, you're going to give 1000 the next month in doing these impossible things, is seeing what it says in verse 8. Because often the time they will, they will grab a hold of this and try to... Um, make it as something that, you know, they're going to make it really emotional, they're going to play the right music, and they're going to pass around the little envelope, and they're going to say, just write down what you're going to give, and fold it up. The only person that's going to see is God, but I've seen behind the scenes in some of those, and they actually budget whatever people promise to give by faith promise. <laughs> they actually budget with that. It's, 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 not the, it's not cool. It's not a great way of doing things. I think that what it should be is, like it says in verse 8, I speak not by commandment. In other words, by constraint. In other words, by by, by making this a ye must, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, in other words, by opportunity that we have seen in others, like the Macedonian church, and to prove the sincerity of your love. In other words, you can take example, you can be encouraged by it, you can, you can desire that. That can be your heart's desire, and, and, and it will show, it will prove the sincerity of your love in this particular situation. He's not trying to constrain people, but trying to bring people to a point where they, they just simply want to have that giving heart. And God says, if their first be a willing mind is accepted. In other words, if you first have that love and a sincerity to do those things, God will work in you in these situations and he will help you to be somebody that is more giving. And I believe that's a great call for all Christians is that we need to be somebody that ministers grace and is often giving. Uh, turn over to chapter 9, and he begins to talk more about that idea of the ministering to the saints. Because we can all go and we can give our money to the Ronald McDonald House. We can give our money to, to Tim Horton's Camp Day. We can give our money to the United Way and all these sorts of things. But I believe that Christians best serve the Lord and give in the area of ministering unto the saints. Why? Because that's going to produce the most eternal fruit. That's going to produce the most increase, not in this life, but perhaps only in the life to come. But what else matters? And so he says in ver uh, chapter 9 and verse 1, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write unto you. So in other words, it's not needed. So this, this is good. I like to see this. I'm encouraged because the Corinthian church in the first Corinthians was just a mess. 
But now you see the apostles starting to encourage them in the fact that, you know, they brought in again that one that was fornicating. They brought in again um, some of the things that they had wronged. Now they're doing right. And he says here, as touching the ministering to the saints, which was something they had trouble with beginning, he says, it's superfluous for me to write unto you. In other words, you have already learned this. You've already grown in this area. And because that church first struggled in 1 Corinthians, they learned this lesson, and now they're able to, with that ready mind and with that ready heart, do what is next. Verse 2 says, For I know the forwardness of your mind, for that for which I boast of you to them in Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. So even as the Macedonian church was lifted up as doing great works in the area of giving, even beyond their capability, here the Apostle Paul is boasting, he says, unto the church of Macedonia of how well the Corinthians are now doing in this area, being giving, charitable Christians. Verse 3, Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain, in this behalf, that, as I said, ye may be ready. Thus happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in the same confident boasting. So while he trusted and said it was superfluous to write unto them, nevertheless, knowing that flesh is flesh, he sends men before to prepare ahead of time, lest when Macedonia comes, they find a church that is not very giving, a church that has sort of forgotten all these things. And if, and if we're flesh, we can all admit that when we're on the straight and narrow one month, a few days can pass and suddenly we're failing in those same things. And the Apostle Paul just wanted to make sure because he had lifted them up as if they had done some great works in the area of giving. He wanted to be make sure that they weren't doing it with a covetous heart, as it says in verse 5. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not of covetousness. I think what it's saying there is he wanted to go before so that there would be no temptation for them in giving of the gift to hope to receive from somebody else the glory for it. He wanted to go to them and make sure that this was a matter of bounty. In other words, a matter of the extras of the heart. And not a matter of giving above and beyond measure. And not just be something where when the Macedonian church comes and Corinth had heard such great things about how they give. And they would be like, well, look how much we're giving. This is great. Like, and they're trying to boost themselves up and trying to lift themselves up in this. And so... Instead of them being covetousness, the Apostle Paul wanted to go and make sure they were doing what was talked about in Ecclesiastes, and that's casting their bread upon many wives. In other words, giving without calculation, which would breed in them, I believe, covetousness. Remember, as we read going forward, that we don't know the works of God. And remember, secondly, what we do know is that law of sowing and reaping. In other words, so we know, and the Bible has secured us up in the fact that sowing and reaping is a legitimate law of God. You sow, that also shall you reap. We also need to know that we don't understand all the works of God. So when you are reaping, you may not reap abundantly today, tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now. You may not even reap in this life, but ye shall reap. The Bible is firm and without apologies, promises that for us. We need to understand those things as we read through a portion like this. Verse 6, it says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful Giver. And so bountifully we sow, we shall reap of the same. But the, but the caveat is given here that you need to do it according to the purpose in your heart. Give then, not grudgingly or of necessity or because somebody laid it upon you and put some sort of guilt upon you. You saw the Macedonians given and now you're going to give the same because of that necessity that's given you. No, you should give with that cheerful heart. This is what he's trying to encourage them in. So bountifully and, show, and so with the purposed 
heart in order to do it with joy, in order to do it with blessing, in order to help others, and not in order to reap of the same. And if you do, I believe the promise is sure that God will work in these situations. Verse 8, the Bible says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. Verse 11, Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving unto God. Thanks and glory be to him. And it says in verse 15, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. What is his unspeakable gift? That when we give, when we do it with the right motives, God is ready to give of us the same. He is ready to administer unto us abundance that causes us to give him more thanks. Why? God loves being glorified. He loves being lifted up. He loves being praised. So when he does exactly what he promises, he knows what it does unto us and to our faith. It helps us to grow. And so Christians today, I encourage you, cast, give, and then let God do the increase. Cast, give, be generous, help others. Make unto thee friends of the man and unrighteousness because you're just somebody that is giving so that when ye fail, you will be received up in everlasting habitations. God will provide the people in your life that you've blessed to come and to help you out when you have fallen in these areas. And it is probably going to be a very important thing when it comes to the tribulation. When we're all generally a giving person and somebody who may not be a believer but has received of your gifts and of your blessing may be willing to put themselves out there to help you because you can't buy or sell, right? There's going to be a time when we can't buy or sell. And God then is providing for us a way to make of ourselves those friends of the mammon of unrighteousness Right? In order that when we fall, when we can't, when we have no way of providing certain things for ourselves, the home around us has fallen and we've got nothing, perhaps there will be there those that by a miracle of God provide for us what we need. Why? Because we've sown and now it has come time in a while after some time has passed for us to reap. Go back to Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> So I believe it is right for us to live this way and to behave this way. Uh, in the context of Ecclesiastes, this is the primary lesson of the whole book, that life is vain, so why not work? Why not rejoice in your work? Why not now give in the vain life, be a giving person in the vain life, minister grace unto others, and here God promises you will receive of the same. Why? Because you cast, and after many days it shall return unto you. Verse 7 says this, one reason why we should live this way is first, primarily, because life is vain. Verse 7, truly the light is sweet and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Right? It's great to have sunny days. It's great to have beautiful days. It's great to have good weather. But don't forget the dark days. They remind us that this is all vanity, that it's just kind of this whirling, twirling cycle of events. It's good, it's bad, it's happy, it's sad. We're always just going to go through this same vain life. Why? Because we've all been under, we've been placed under the current realm that we're living. And that's in the earthly, carnal realm. So here he says, since life is vain, why not give? Whether it's good or whether it's bad, whether it's a light day or a dark day, they're all vain. So as he's been teaching, we need to rejoice in those things. We also need to not forget about those things. We need to remember that our life is full of ups and downs. When we're happy, hey, just remember that there might be a sad day coming. When we're sad, rejoice because happiness comes in the morning, right? The next time, the next season of your life is just perhaps a few moments away. So we just need to understand that this life is this vain cycle, and so be given. Why? Because you give, and for some of us, we may be strapped for one day, two days, three days, but hey, God's providing another paycheck. Maybe there's a gift down the line. Maybe he's got something in his plans where he would support his own who have that giving heart, who give of themselves, yea, and even beyond themselves. And life is primarily vain, so why not be a giving person. There's, there's no sense in storing up what we have here. There's no sense in holding on to what we have. Just give it. Just, just be somebody that casts it and expects after many days to receive it. Be somebody that's giving. I'm going to support seven. Hey, why not even eight? Go above and beyond. Be somebody that just has a giving heart. God so loved the world that he gave, correct? Well, let's model our Lord. Let's, let's follow after the same things. Let's have that same heart and that same desire. Follow his example. 
Verse 9 says, Rejoice, O young men. This is the next way. The first reason is that life is vain. The next thing you have to see is that life is short. Verse 9, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. And here is just the description of every young man, the description of every young person, the description of myself when I was younger. As I was just going to let my heart cheer me, I was just going to, in the days of my youth, walk in my ways, fall off to the sight of my eyes. Whatsoever I desired, I was going to do. But I didn't have this reminder, and I wish I would. It says, but know that. That for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. And this kind of brings our youth, the vanity of our youth, into a perspective where it hits close to home. We think we're just doing whatever pleases us. We think we're just following our heart and following our eyes. But there's a consequence. God is going to bring even these things into judgment. And looking back, I know this to be true. Looking back now, youth was but a flicker. It was just here one day and gone the next and suddenly I'm grown and suddenly I'm growing and looking back now it seems so far away but had I known that warning that God will bring the days of my youth into judgment even as I recognize I've brought my own days into judgment and I look back and I said man that was dumb that was wicked that was wrong and I've already prejudged those things and saw them as they are now from this side looking back but know still that God will bring these same things into judgment. And if we're not saved, well, have mercy. Because you will be judged by being condemned and cast lake fire for those wicked things that you've done in your past. But even still, you will look back on these things in judgment. Reading the scriptures as a saved believer. And these things won't bring you good feelings. I don't look in my past when I used to think I was so cool and just say, man, that was awesome things. I look back in regret and remorse. And, and, and I realize that there's so much sorrow attributed to the decisions that I made when I was young. Life is short, friends. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart. That's verse 10. Remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh. For childhood and youth are vanity. And that's the best thing that a young person can do. Remove sorrow. And how do you do that? You put away evil. In other words, right now, make the decision to put away evil. Would to God I would have put away evil when I was a young person. I would have made better decisions. It would have saved me much sorrow that today I feel, the scars that today I feel. But this is an interesting thing, is that today, think about it, today is the childhood and youth of your tomorrow. Today is the childhood and youth of your tomorrow. And the Bible says here that childhood and youth are vanity. Tomorrow I'm going to be one day older than I was today. And I'm going to look back and that is past. That is vain. That is childhood and youth. So I need to, as I look back on 10, 15 years ago and say, man, I did some stupid things. I should probably do some of that inner reflection right now and look back into even what I've done three days ago and say, man, I need to do more to put away sorrow from my heart by removing the evil that I have done and even the evil that I'm doing. Because today... Is, is the youngest I'm ever going to be. This is my youth right now to tomorrow and to three weeks from now and to a month from now. Today is going to be the youngest I will ever be. So if I want to give, I need to make the decision to give now. If I want to rejoice, I need to make the decision to be content where I'm at, work hard, and do what Ecclesiastes puts forth as great godly techniques or great godly um, abilities and things that I should do in order to rejoice. And what is that? Work hard, rejoice with the wife of my youth, uh, and, just, and just seek to please God above all things. And the best thing that I can do is to just try to live less fleshly. Try to live to satisfy my flesh. Why? Because everything in the realm of the world which we are living in is just carnal. It is just vain. It is just nothing but a flicker in the scheme of things that are eternal. We need to understand that today is the day to make decisions that will affect us for tomorrow. And if we're to put away evil, there's much less sorrow to be had for tomorrow. We're still caught up in this vain life, yet we're still reaping what we sow. So what I do today, the mistakes that I make today, the, the wrong, the evil that I do today, I will reap of the same down the line. So we need to understand that. We need to bring that into the context. Be somebody that is giving, somebody that is sowing, somebody that is casting thy bread upon waters, and it needs to be good things, righteous things, upright things, because that is how in the future I will reap of the same. After many days I shall find what I cast today.
The overarching theme of what's being talked about here is being somebody that is giving. Give a portion to seven and why not to eight? Cast thy bread upon waters. Be somebody that is giving. In the context of this vain life, why? Because your riches, your income, your finances mean nothing in the grand scheme of things, especially given that we live under a God that will always recompense for you and give you back of what you have given after many days. And he also promises us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He also promises that his seed has never banked bread. In other words, we'll be sustained for it. So cast thy bread. Why? Because... God's seed will never beg for it. We will never want for it. We will never desire for it. We will never be short of it. So cast it. Send it out there. Give a portion. Be somebody that's giving. Cast that. And you shall receive of the same after many days.